In today's episode, we're going to have a look at the UK and can we just simply increase production levels by opening up the taps? Well, here on the left is a picture of the Brent crude price going back from sort of around about the mid 70s up until a week or two ago and on the right you can see the gas price now if we look at the um, graph on the left initially you can see that there's a, a real roller coaster of a ride um, for the oil price um, on the uh, gas price not quite as uh, much fluctuation but you can see in recent weeks um, with the Russia Ukraine war that the gas price has really soared Let's spend a little bit of uh, time, and instead of thinking about this in terms of crude oil, let's think about it in terms of a commodity that some of us will know, a Mars bar. Now, this piece of confectionery, perhaps you could buy it back here in the late 70s at a cost of around about 15 pence. But then it more than doubled in price here by 1980 to 38 pence a bar. In the uh, 2007 sort of time period, it would cost you £1.31 wait until 2020 and you could buy the Mars bar for 22 pence and now it's gone up to over one pound and eight pence again now this analog is really for those who are not so familiar with commodity price fluctuations and really for the oil and gas companies who are trying to plan their business when you have the the product fluctuating in price quite so much it's very very difficult or risky to make uh, financial investments when you really don't know where the oil price is going to be. Now the headlines have been around for a while talking about how the gas prices have been soaring in, in particular related to the war in Ukraine but the government has looked at some measures so there was an announcement that there were going to be six North Sea fields fast-tracked by the UK government and beneath you can see the Prime Minister says the UK will ramp up gas production. Well, let's have a look at that because it really isn't just as easy as all that. So here's a look at the UK oil and gas production through time. Now, the oil production is in green and it starts here in 1975, ramps up. This dip is actually the consequence of the Piper Alpha disaster and then it recovers to around about 2000 and then you can see there's been a decline right through until about 2012 and it has stabilized in the last few years although there seems to be some downward pressure of late compare and contrast with the in purple here is the gas now all this data is taken from the north sea transition agency's um, pprs database which is an online and publicly available source of data however um, we do have little confidence in much of the data in here and certainly there's a lot of gas production that's missing from the database for decades and uh, they include the production from some of these uh, major fields. But for the purposes of what we're going to show today and discuss, we are aware of problems, emissions, errors within the data set, but the bigger picture should not be affected by that. If we uh, take a, a look here at this graph, and this shows the production of oil and gas measured in barrels of oil equivalent per day, and uh, it's through time, so you can see there was a major, major ramp up here. This is the land situation, onshore UK, and it's one field, it's Witch Farm, which is down in, in Dorset on the southern coast of England. And this is really the profile, the production profile, of a, of a single field. All the other fields are actually these tiny little boxes over here, and you can see none of them are particularly significant. So it's dominated by this one-horse race, the witch farm field. And you can see that there's been a, a, a very, very steep decline, followed by gentler decline in, in recent years. Now, if we want to try and understand what causes this, then we need to understand how oil fields work and, and why production declines. Well, there's kind of two reasons one is that if you uh, imagine shaking our pepsi or coke bottle and then basically letting the lid off very very quickly and you can see that uh, it just all the gas comes out of solution and what you get left with is a, a much less energetic and lively liquid in the bottle of course in the process you'll have lost half the, the coke on the floor and so pressure drop is one of the reasons why oil fields decline another reason 
is that the water rate increases as the oil and gas rate decreases. Now, that can be shown, again, just looking at the Witch Farm field. You can see that uh, here's the oil production ramping up and then declining through time. Now, this decline is actually concurrent with the water cut starts to increase. The water cut is a measure of the, the ratio of water to oil, so we're getting a lot more water production to the point now where you can see that the fields mainly producing water with a very little bit of oil. Now, more typically when we look at an area, we're looking at a, a lot of fields. And in this uh, box here at the bottom, you can see the contribution from many, many fields in the Central North Sea area of the UK sector. You can see Forties and Buzzard are some of the bigger fields in here, but there are quite a number uh, that are shown. The overall profile for this region is shown here and it peaks just around about in the sort of uh, 2003 and since then has been on a, a very steady decline and even in more recent times is declining quickly. Now this is a consequence of um, there being quite a number of new fields and new fields tend to decline faster than old fields. If we look at the west of Shetlands again a similar picture you see a period of decline, then this increase, which we can talk about in a second, and then another period of decline. Now, in the case of the West of Shetlands, there are really only two big fields and six moderate fields. So BP Shehalian is one of those, and BP's Foynaven is the other. Shehalian has been off station for some time. When it goes back on station, you can see the ramp up. Foynaven, well, in April 2021, BP announced the production suspension at Foynaven and it will permanently remove the uh, the FPSO due to uh, some cracks that have developed in the hull. There's a big question mark over whether uh, a redevelopment is justified and perhaps there needs to be some incentivization to, to make that uh, an easier economic decision. But the um, recent production decline is marked. Look at the Southern North Sea, which is really uh, predominantly gas and, and only gas. And what we can see here is that um, it, we're measuring it in barrels of oil equivalent again. But you can see this uh, this sawtooth pattern. The reason for this is that in summer there is maintenance and there's not much demand. And then demand ramps up in, in winter, particularly for heating on shore. So there is a lot of demand that goes in. So hence these spikes throughout. But you can see in more recent times, these spikes are not as, as pronounced as they were before. When we look below, uh, we can see the distribution of fields. And again, lots and lots of fields contribute to this profile. But the ones marked with an X are fields that have ceased production, some of which have been uh, completely abandoned, but others are in the process of it. And, and we can see that we've lost Hewitt and Viking, Victor and Audrey, and a, a variety of fields in here. So... There is uh, a lot of fields that are going, and, and of course we have lost some major infrastructure in the uh, the logs and the Thettlethorpe terminal have all closed. Looking at the Northern North Sea, uh, and that's mainly known as the sort of the Brent province. Uh, there is a bit more to it than that. But these are the fields listed underneath here. You can see it's sort of a, a plateau rate of about one and a half million barrels of oil equivalent uh, for a good decade or more uh, and then around about the uh, the mid to late 1990s the decline starts and you can see that it continues on to around about 2011. In this period of time here the production has been remarkably flat very very low decline but there is the potential for um, a domino effect where most of the fields get closed in all at the same time. Now that could be the subject of another video to explain how that all happens but you can see here the Brent field has gone, Turn, Thistle, Murchison, Frigg, Dunlin and a variety of smaller fields here. We haven't completed the analysis in here but already these fields they have ceased production and will not be produced unless they can justify some small-scale redevelopment in the future. The Irish Sea, a similar story. The Irish Sea was mainly about the South Morecambe and North Morecambe fields, which were used for 
gas storage as well as um, gas production. And again, it was to, um, they were basically used for the winter peak demand and more or less shut in during the summer. This continued through into the, uh, the early 2000s, but you can see that by 2010, this had dropped. In recent times, in the last sort of eight years, the decline has been slower, but it is still going down at a significant rate. There has been very low levels of activity, either uh, exploration or de development drilling, in the last decade in this basin. So, taking everything into account, and here's the breakdown by the basins that we've discussed in the previous slides, we kind of assign uh, what the maximum value approximately was in each of these, and it's measured in millions of barrels of oil equivalent per day. It got up to about 5 million. They peaked at slightly different times. You can see that as of uh, end 2021, we now only produce 1.5 million barrels of oil equivalent per day from the UK and UKCS. So when it's uh, let's turn the taps on, which the politicians have called for, and let's ramp up production, well, the taps are nearly always fully open. They always have been and will continue to be. And the main reason for that is that there's a huge capital investment associated with oil and gas fields, and you have to keep the taps fully open to try and get payback as quickly as possible and sort of maximise uh, the profit, which comes only after years of production. The approval of new fields, well, we'll, we'll look at the six that have been fast-tracked for development in the, the next slide. The discussion um, hold a, a new licensing round. Well, there is a lead time on that, and licensing rounds do take. The process takes quite some time, unless it can be streamlined. And it's likely that there may not be much drilling, and unlikely that we'll get any production within sort of the next three to eight years. So there is um, this isn't a short-term fix. Politicians uh, have now been calling to you know, the oil company to try and get us out of the energy crisis that we find ourselves in. But um, there's been years of kind of neglect and indifference from uh, a variety of um, ministers who are responsible for energy. And uh, we really got to question whether it's too little too late. We can import more oil and gas and liquefied natural gas from abroad. And um, Boris Johnson was across in the Middle East trying to get various uh, Arab nations to start producing uh, more oil and gas and sending it over to the UK. But we're becoming increasingly reliant now on, on that area of the world to get our, our energy supplies. Get renewables online and contributing? Well, you know, we've made great progress on offshore wind, onshore wind, um, with solar. We're looking at developing tidal and wave. Um, but all of these take time, and there are long lead times on these. And uh, what I see is some of the same onerous regulatory oversight that, that we've seen increase within the oil and gas sector. And of course, for some of the, uh, the electricity production from renewables, the issue that's yet to be addressed and uh, adequately um, sorted is, is the issue of storing the electricity. Nuclear, well... We know the story, size we'll see, is being constructed, but we're still decades away. And, and over the next uh, couple of decades, we're going to see some of the reactors being retired. Any other in inputs? Well, please feel free to uh, add comments below. I'm sure we'll be doing follow-up videos uh, on this area. Looking at the uh, six field developments that are being fast-tracked, well, here's where we get our information from. It's from our Trove databases, and you can see it's rich in information, and we just have to dip in to find, find out the details in each and every one of these fields. We're going to just look at a high level today at these and just show where they are. This is a map comes from Expro News. And then in here, you can see Rosebank. is a good-sized oil field. It's expected to go to sanction in the second quarter of 2022. Uh, Jackdaw is a moderate-sized oil field. There's still some uncertainty on the range of reserves. Tollmount East is a, is a gas field down in the Southern Gas Base, and it's going to be a tieback. Uh, talking of uh, numbers of sort of 53, but we've also seen that it's a little bit smaller in terms of its gas initially in place. Brodig is very, very small. Catcher, again, is just a, a small tieback 
of satellites in that region. And Marigold is a modest-sized oil field development in the Outer Murray Firth. It's a good start, for sure, but um, you know we have this ongoing decline in production that we're seeing in every basin in the UKCS. Now, none of these are going to be game changers. They will, at best, halt the decline, perhaps, but um, we're years away from first production, even with some of these. Our previous video on Cambo, which was 170 million barrel oil field west of Shetland, and uh, that was stopped in 2021, but that really needs to be put back on the fast track. It still won't be able to deliver oil for perhaps two or three or maybe four years, because when you stop a project, all the orders are cancelled and there's long lead times on many of those. So what's compounding the confusing picture that we're drawing here? Well, the global oil price collapse. The oil price has been uh, low until very, very recently, and the gas price too. So there wasn't really a great incentive to invest huge amounts of money in it. There's been pressure on everywhere to... Um, to head towards net zero, a lot of political and public pressure. But what everybody needs to realise is it's transition, not stop dead. COP26, being in Glasgow in the UK, perhaps there was a pressure on politicians to be seen to be setting a very high standard on reducing carbon footprint. Well, that's fine, but if we end up having to import oil from halfway around the planet, then associated with that is a higher carbon footprint. Company shareholders, well, they've been demanding action at various annual general meetings and other fora. Investors want to see ESG policies. We see increasing bureaucracy from regulators and others. We've already seen the domino effect in the Southern North Sea with the Logs gas pipeline system and the Thedlethorpe terminal both shutting, which brought about the premature cessation of production from a number of gas fields in the Southern North Sea area. In the Northern North Sea, well, it's going to be interesting to see what plans are afoot to try and save the Sullumvo terminal on the Shetland Islands with the Brent system pipeline and the Ninian pipeline system uh, both feeding into that and bringing oil from a lot of the Brent province oil fields and beyond. We have in recent times seen an alternation of licensing rounds from a frontier areas to traditional mature areas. And these have been held at irregular intervals, but generally or approximately a year apart. This is, a, in effect, has actually slowed down the turnover of acreage. And, and we really do want to see if this new licensing round that all areas get opened up to give uh, our opportunity. But it really is quite late in the day. And, you know, you can't just pick up momentum from a standing start. Licensing round processes need to be streamlined. I mean, in the UK now, uh, the process is taking longer than it does in some developing countries. There are about 30 different countries, all with licensing rounds in 2022. And, you know, the UK has got to compete on that world stage. And there are areas where simply there's more potential. And then there's the COVID global pandemic, uh, which has not helped matters. Now, what's the industry's reaction been? Well, the industry's been trying to get funding, but the banks have been closed, certainly for exploration and to a marked degree to uh, development as well. Reserve-based lending is, is a rarity. Main investment um, has come uh, in recent times from the uh, private equity sector, and from the major oil companies who are able to fund developments out of their crude oil sales and gas sales and indeed their cash flow. Exploration and appraisal drilling is at the lowest level since the UK offshore activity really got started back in the 1960s. Now this is going to be the subject of an article in Expro News which will be coming out in the next few days. Field developments have recently started being challenged by regulators. Opred, in the case of the Jackdaw development, CNC, the public, politicians, all getting involved in the Cambo development plans. Uh, you can see our video on that. And in the Marigold, Sunflower and Yeoman, what was the OGA, now the NTSA, have stated that they want it to be re-looked at as how that feels developing. Well, you know, it's the companies that are taking the financial risk to actually put the money up to develop the fields. 
disconnect with OGA. I mean, publishing a lot of regulation, lots of guidance notes, uh, lots of onerous demands on the operators, and also charging a, a pretty penny for their services. The industry is trying to come to terms with these rocketing commodity prices to try and uh, ensure a security of supply. It's interesting when commodity prices soared in recent times that some started calling for a windfall tax. Well, we didn't see very much help for the oil and gas industry during the downturns. And now all of a sudden, when, yes, things are more profitable, um, to call for a windfall tax again means that uh, it's difficult to, to plan any further future investments. We will never go back to the industry that there was. And we can say that because many of the drilling rigs that were around even three, four, five years ago have since been scrapped. The seismic acquisition fleet has been decimated. Projects have been deferred worldwide, and the entire supply chain has been squeezed and downsized. They don't have the capacity. Now, everybody will try and ramp up as activity takes off, but, you know, it won't happen overnight, and it'll never get back to the levels in the North Sea that it was previously. So government reaction, well... The, uh, the PM was calling for a, a new task force to, to have a look not just at oil and gas, but at the entire uh, energy portfolio. Um, this new task force hopefully will uh, become aware of some of the issues in this, in this video. And whether you agree or disagree, please put some comments below, give some feedback. It will be reaching many thousands of people in the industry, so have your say on what is happening and what should be happening. In summary, production decline is relentless. The UKCS is indeed a mature province, and exploration and appraisal drilling has almost dried up. We've talked in a previous video of the 480 discoveries, the 2,400 plus prospects and leads. A new licensing round may deliver more discoveries in time, but not going to produce any more oil and gas in the short to medium term. In researching this, I came across a very interesting article which I would recommend you might want to have a look at. We'll put a link below and it's a look at how the ownership has changed within the North Sea and how there are maybe some questions as to which nation has the interests in the North Sea. Subscribe to the channel, give us a thumbs up, ring the bell if you want to be informed when we have a new video coming out. And there's our details if you want to get in touch. Thank you very much for listening and I hope to see you back on our channel soon.